Welcome to another episode of Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here at the News Forum, where all voices matter. Well, the country's finances are a matter of continuing debate in political and economic circles, and we're pleased to have, returning to our program, Kevin Page. He's the president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, and he's also the former parliamentary budget officer. Welcome back, Kevin. Good to be with you, Tony. I guess, first of all, uh, we've just had a 2022 uh, federal budget, uh, so I'd love to get your, your take on it. Are we in for an era of free spending, or are we in for an era of fiscal restraint? How, how do you see things moving? Yeah, we might be somewhere in between right now, Tony. I think um, there was an expectation that there was going to be a fairly large spending budget. I think it turned out to be a little bit more measured and you know, modest than I think what a, lo um, a lot of us were expecting, particularly after the NDP and the Liberals came to a, a coalition type agreement for the next few years. Yeah, so uh, from your perspective, what were the big spending items in it and what did you see that wasn't in it? Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, modest in terms of, of you know just comparison with past budgets, so you know, just in terms of some of these big numbers, Tony, like over the next five, six years, um, you know, the government was really on a net spending basis, really talking about spending something in the order of $30 billion. And, you know, that kind of spending was really, that's not a lot of spending when you think about, you know, the government spends over $400 billion every year and we're a $2.5, $2.6 trillion economy. So mm -hmm. modest in that sense. And I think modest in terms of the way they allocated the money across, you know, a handful of priorities. Uh, including national defense, you know, including growth, which was a bit of a surprise. A lot of us were wondering whether this government was really going to talk about growth mm -hmm. and what the government could do to stimulate growth. Um, you know, some more monies for indigenous people, for health care um, and, and housing. So, you know, it's just overall, you know, relatively modest spending measures spread out amongst a number of different priorities. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, what do you see uh, from this as the long term implications for fiscal policy? Yeah, I think the government <clears throat> realizes that we're a bit of a we're at a pivot point now. And I think um, it, you know, the, the planning assumptions for this budget were, were, were done early. So there was really done in pre, pre, you know, Russia uh, Ukraine war. There were the survey with the private sector, which you're familiar with, Tony, took place probably in, in, in a January timeframe. Mm -hmm. So it really didn't capture you know some of the what people are worried about now with some of the economic consequences of Ukraine could be. So I think like the government was a bit careful not to come out in an inflationary environment with really too much more deficit financing of, yeah. of really consumption style programs. So I think really long term, it's still a bit of a question mark. Like where will the government go come in the fall? I think it will depend in part how you know the world economy kind of unfolds over the next number of months. Do you think that it did then as a budget uh, kind of frame the inflationary risks uh, appropriately? Well, I think there is, you know, there's, um, I think it's mindful that there are inflation risks, like we saw an increase uh, in terms of the planning assumption and the inflation rate. Uh, I think they're probably underestimated what the, you know, the consumer price rate of inflation will be in terms of a planning assumption for 2022. They came in around 4%, and the Bank of Canada was sitting at around 5%. So, you know, interest rates, those sorts of you know, numbers as well, we're, 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 we might be underestimating in terms of that planning environment. Mm -hmm. I think, again, I think more conceptually, though, the government, um, you know, is really you know, kind of assuming that, you know, Canada, for the most part, at least at the first round effects of, of the Ukraine-Russia war will be a positive terms of trade effect for Canada. We'll see export prices rise relative to import prices. A lot of our oil producers some of our metals, even some of our agriculture products will benefit by these higher prices. So the first, you know, the, you know, the, the first economic effect is pretty positive. The, the more dangerous sort of secondary effect, though, is the effect on real personal disposable incomes. Right. You know, people are about to get squeezed with inflation running above 6% with wages in that kind of 3% growth, growth range. And with interest rates kind of going up, I think it's, it's that longer term squeeze. I think that the government is worried about how, how is this going to play out over the next year or two? Are we headed for something like uh, that would, some people would call a stagflationary type of environment? Yeah, I agree with you on that. I think that uh, the storm clouds are, uh, are gathering and uh, you're seeing all of these indicators of uh, uh, inflation rate that uh, is surprising in its resiliency, perhaps, like uh, we all knew that post-pandemic, there might be a bump in prices, uh, but uh, this is 
this is looking like a longer term trend. We're going to continue with this discussion, though. I think there's a lot more to unpack here uh, with our guest, uh, Kevin Page. Stay with us. We'll be right back after these short messages. And welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Kevin Page. He's now the president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa, former parliamentary budget officer. Kevin, one of the interesting sort of slides in the budget or, or charts uh, was the OECD rankings, which put Canada 38 out of 38 advanced countries in terms of future growth. What's what's going on there? What what how do you how do you unpack that for us? Yeah, it's it's a terrible ranking, obviously, Tony. I think it's um, I think that type of evidence has probably encouraged the government to actually talk about growth in a more forceful way in, in its latest budget. Again, we didn't really see a lot from the Liberals in the policy platform that was really talking about growth. Um, so, I, I mean, in Canada, I think his, historically, at least for the last number, number of decades, we've seen relatively low productivity uh, growth rates relative to other countries, certainly in, uh, our, with respect to our biggest trading part of the United States. And also, we're, we're obviously dealing with an aging demographic, which affects labor force input, uh, labor force participation. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern. Like, how do we grow the economy in the future that like, will generate these sort of revenues that will pay for important programs I think Canadians want in general, like, like a public support childcare type of program. Um, so yeah, I think also we've seen relatively weak business investment, um, you know, even I think going into prior to COVID. And um, I mean, there's lots of room for business investment to grow and it, we're probably with interest rates rising, we're not gonna make that, you know, easier for businesses. Also with inflation relatively high and rising, maybe it's also be a little bit more difficult, but we certainly want a lot more business investment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there is some talk in the budget with in terms of stimulating that investment. And you know, really, in, you know, and so those, those strategic minerals that are gonna be so important for us to really electrify uh, our, um, our, our economy going forward. Yeah, I, you raise a couple of really interesting points there. Uh, you know, obviously, as you said right at the outset, this was in the wake of the Liberal NDP agreement on supply and, uh, and uh, approving budgets and whatnot, confidence motions in the House of Commons. Uh, and so a lot of emphasis or a lot of people were looking for social programs, uh, enhancement, that kind of thing. But you're also seeing, and this is your point as well, like uh, the, the government included that uh, that chart showing us 38 out of 38 countries in terms of future growth, they, uh, they wouldn't put that in the budget document unless they were concerned about it. They wanted to somehow show that they were addressing it. So you've got kind of two things happening at the same time in the budget. I don't want to overanalyze here, but you've got, you know, the promises they made for social spending, let's put it that way, but they're also concerned about uh, future economic growth, which of course, that's the basically the way that you pay for all of these things. Is that, am, am I being too simplistic in my analysis or do you, do you see that as well? No, I, I see that as well, um, Tony. I think, um, I mean, this evidence that, you know, Canada's, you know, productivity has been, has been sluggish and that has an impact on our ability to kind of grow the economy. Um, I think the government over the past couple of years, there's so much focus has been dealing with the pandemic. It's, you know, it's, it's talked about the post COVID economy, but it's really hard to make that transition in policy terms when you're still dealing with pretty significant infection rates. Um, so again, now we're in this environment. I think we saw that in the Ontario budget as well, you know, the need to have make important investments in infrastructure that will actually grow a different economy in the post COVID world. Mm. And uh, I think it's a healthy thing, but I think, you know, Canada, I think other, some other countries as well, and, and the provinces are struggling to make that transition. So yeah, we're living um, in those sort of, two, you know, sort of those two camps. Um, there seems to be a debate also now about monetary policy as well as fiscal policy. Uh, maybe this is outside of your mandate, but I'd love to get your point of view on, on what's happening here. Yeah, I think there's a sense that, um, you know, in this in difficult environment where we've had like a supply shock uh, thanks to the pandemic, and I think, you know, experiencing potentially another global supply shock because of the Russia-Ukraine war that, like, you know, we still have to find a way to normalize policies 
fiscal policies where we saw deficits, you know, well above $300 billion a few years ago, coming down fairly dramatically last year. I think that was one of the big surprises in the budget 2022 mm -hmm. that the economy did grow, that produced a lot more revenue. So the deficit was, but still over $100 billion, which is kind of unthinkable, Tony, in, the, in your times as, you know, as you know, president of the Treasury Board to run deficits, you know, five percent, four or five percentage points of GDP. So I think it's important that fiscal policy that we take the foot off the gas pedal. And I think the same way on monetary policy that, you know, with um, the policy rates, um, you know, need to go up. Hold, hold on to that thought. Sorry, Kevin, we're going to take another brief break, but I do want to return to this very important point. We'll be back after these messages. And welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, here with Kevin Page. Uh, formerly, uh, he was uh, the parliamentary budget officer, and now he's the president and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. Kevin, I had to interrupt you, but very interesting point about uh, the challenges that uh, on the monetary side that the Bank of Canada has. Uh, please continue with your thought. Yeah, so it's again somewhat similar to the uh, on, with respect to fiscal policy. We need to you know normalize effectively these policies in in a in a, uh, in a different environment. So we know that interest rates have to go up. We had record low interest rates during the pandemic, and you know these rates are, are rising. We saw you know two interest rate increases in Canada, one of twenty five basis points, another of fifty basis points. We just heard very recently today, literally, that the Federal Reserve is now raising interest rates, uh, an increase of 50 basis points. So we're probably still sitting you know, a good two and a half percentage point or two percentage points below even what a neutral policy rate would be mm -hmm. for a central bank in Canada. And then there's, there's talk even that, you know, with inflation rates running at six to seven percent, we might even need higher policy rates. So, again, try to prepare Canadians. Uh, households and businesses that these rates have to go up. That these are this is really a process of normalization to bring inflation in line, uh, interest rates and inflation more in line. And mm. um, this is going to happen. We're, we're as you know, budgets are going to have to adjust both federal budgets, but household budgets, business budgets as well. Do you see uh, the monetary policy and the fiscal policy? Are they kind of in concert now, or are they at cross purposes? What what do you see right now? I think we we need to bring them in concert. I think like you can see that um, you know just like with the budget track that we're on right now, these deficits fall to well less, much less than one percentage point of GDP over the medium term. Um, so you know that would be a healthier range for to run a, a budgetary deficit at the federal level in Canada, still sustainable in terms of long term, but um, you know more you know, more fitting for the economic times. I think policy interest rates. We know that they're going up and, um, you know, they're going to have to go up by a few percentage points. So I think both are trying to work in concert to try to bring about an environment that would be less inflationary and a bit more stable for the long term. But the trick is to make these adjustments and not to, you know, to create an unstable economy. Right, right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you recently were talking about uh, what uh, about bad uh, public finance management involving the Department of National Defense. I think I read some commentary on that. Can you explain what you were concerned about with the, the with the Department of National Defense? Yeah, I think, Tony, I think it had to do with um, really a transparency issue mm -hmm. uh, where um, we, you know, the government's under a lot of pressure to kind of work move our defense spending share up to sort of NATO standards. Um, you know, NATO standards are trying to get something like, you know, 2% national defense spending share relative to GDP. Mm -hmm. We're sitting probably at 1.4%. And again, <clears throat> when, when the parliament and when the media is looking at these numbers, they're seeing a, a line for defense spending that is much higher in the budgetary documents than it is in the defense planning documents. And so we're not, I think, parliamentarians, in, of which you were one, both in opposition and, and you know, as a cabinet minister, like the, there needs to be this sort of scrutiny. So to, so to have very different medium term spending tracks around is not helpful for in terms of scrutinizing the quality of that defense spending budget over the next five years. So is the concern that the promises are, uh, can be made, but that uh, there's no plan in place to actually fulfill the promise? Is that, is that what you're concerned about? I think, again, I think it's, um, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the Department of National Defense sort of, you know, catching up um, with central agencies, with the, you gotcha. know, with the Department of Finance and 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 the Treasury Board Secretariat. 
Um, I think that ultimately the, those, those spending numbers, I think Parliament's going to plan are the ones that appeared in the budget. But, you know, we have much lower spending numbers in the national defense, uh, you know, you know medium term spending documents. So, yeah, we have to, you know, we have to get those those lines integrated. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, reform of financial management in Ottawa. That's probably something that your institute is, is concerned with. Uh, is that a possibility or would you like to see that move forward? Yeah, I think you know we've we've talked about uh, you know integrating budget budgetary exercises you know um, that's done at the Department of Finance and your old department you know Treasury Board Secretary that you know, so linking those sort of spending lines more directly. Um, I think uh, I think one good thing is that we heard I think in budget it's it's a small item that the governments are committed to you know strategic policy reviews. Uh, it was something that your government did do, I think, early in your mandate, you know, in 2000, if I remember cor correctly, 2007, Tony, you conducted right. strategic review exercises later in the mandate uh, or in, in towards 2000, after the 2012 budget, there was a deficit reduction action plan. Right. This government actually commits to kind of looking at those spending lines to do strategic policy reviews, to look for savings. I think, you know, the, the, I'm hopeful that that could lead to some positive reforms as well. And we're back with Kevin Page, President and CEO of the Institute of Fiscal Studies and Democracy at the University of Ottawa. And that's my next question, actually, Kevin. You're, the title includes democracy. It's not just fiscal studies, it's fiscal studies and democracy. Are there any trends that you're concerned about on the democracy side of the ledger? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, it's really kind of a, really a global perspective to put fiscal studies and democracy in, kind of into our thinking and to look at that nexus between, you know, institutions and, and you know, and how governments support um, the public. So, like, in, you know, obviously, I think democracies around the world I, are struggling. We're seeing this, you know, kind of historic moment taking place in the Ukraine. And we're watching uh, a lot of liberal type democracies really like work to, you know, more collaboratively to support, uh, you know, that country. I think, you know, having strong institutions is really kind of, an, you know, an essential thing. And, and um, so, yeah, building, you know, strengthening our institutions, you know, making sure we have strong, you know, uh, strong uh, legislatures, that there's good oversight, there's good review, you know, in some cases, independent offices do help, auditor generals, probably budget officers, are examples of strong institutions. Um, but I think as we kind of move forward, even new developments, I think there's more talk around building, looking at national infrastructure needs assessments, working across levels of government with First Nations people, looking mm -hmm. at those infrastructure needs that we're gonna to need to put in place over the number of, uh, you know, number of decades to get to net zero to build a more inclusive economy. So I think, yeah, importance of these institutions in, in terms of our fiscal decision-making is, is is really is the kind of space that we like to focus in on. So. Uh do I take it, were you doing work in Ukraine, by the way, before the invasion? Was that one of the things you were doing? Yeah, we, I did do, I was working with the foundation out of, out of, um, yeah, out of really London, London, England, okay. and had a couple of visits to Kyiv. In fact, ironically, just on my cell phone, it popped up a picture that I had with some officials where we were in Kyiv, again, a couple of trips. Um, they were looking to strengthen their oversight of their Department of Finance Committee. Uh, lots of, you know, now the talk is obviously shifting to, you know, what some people are calling a need for almost a Marshall Plan to rebuild uh, Ukraine, uh, just enormous loss of infrastructure and buildings in, in addition to the huge loss of life. So yeah, work that we can do. And I think maybe this is a way we can reinvigorate democracies by coming together and helping others that really showed us like, we shouldn't take this for granted. Right. Uh, the kind of freedoms that we have and, um, um, yeah, so yeah, it's it's sad to watch what's going on in place in Ukraine, but it's also inspiring to see the leadership in Ukraine and the rest of the world provide you know the kind of appropriate responses. And I guess the focal point of, of your institute is that in order to have a properly functioning democracy, you do have to concern yourself with that, say, transparency in budgets and uh, accountability for budgets, those kinds of things. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and, you know, there are international institutions the, um, and surveys like the Open Budget Survey that kind of make sure like we allow us to compare where does Canada fit with respect to other countries. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I'm happy to say that we actually do okay in terms of those open budget surveys that we have, we're in pretty good standing, but there's always room for improvement. I think, in, you know, to, to maintain these strong liberal democracies, we want to continue to be improving. So do, do you have uh, kind of a series of recommendations on what should be improved? 
Well, I think one of the issues we talked about already today, Tony, I found myself a number of years ago uh, in front of parliamentary committees talking about the need to, re, re, you know, to improve that supply process. Right. I, I remember when you were president of the Treasury Board, I just thought that there's an offer, and I'm a former president, a Treasury Board official and Department of Finance official. Like, I think we should have a budget that is completely integrated. So like, you know, you know the national defense medium term budget is built directly into our, our overall spending budget. And then, you know, I think the parliament can easily, you know, the, we all, all contract the spending numbers and we, we don't get lost in these sort of different lines. Mm. You know, that would be an area I think that we, we need to focus in on just improving that integration between our budget and what we, you would call the supply estimate system. Are you, uh, we've got about uh, 30 seconds left, are you kind of optimistic that we can make some changes? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, off, sometimes these changes take place in, in crises. Um, you know, um, I think, um, again, I was fortunate enough to be the parliamentary budget officer. I got that opportunity in thanks to your, your government. Uh, that, that promoted that idea to build an institution. Uh, so these, you know, these opportunities do come along. I really think that, you know, there's some big opportunities around infrastructure, maybe working with First Nations people in a very different way. So I think, yeah, we have those opportunities. Sometimes you need a crisis to really to seize these opportunities. Well, Kevin Page, I wish you every success at your institute at the University of Ottawa. And uh, thanks again for your enlightening responses today. Honored to be with you, Tony, as always. Thank you. Thanks again to Kevin Page, always a great guest, uh, some great insights on the budgetary process and uh, yeah, how your dollars are spent. Thanks for watching today.